Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming today to listen to m about my project. Um, uh, this is Ocelot, this uh, Ruby compiler I've been trying to write. Ocelot is a preliminary name, and it's also a preliminary implementation, meaning um, in spite of how much work I put into it. I'm sorry. Uh, Ocelot is a preliminary name, and it's also a preliminary implementation, which means that in spite of how much work I put into it, it's still uh, uh, not very far along. Uh, but um, I've, I've gotten through the difficult parts, I think, and so some exciting stuff should start happening soon. Um, now, my, my goal with this project is to have a, an efficient implementation of Ruby uh, while supporting the full semantics of the language. Um, now, that's not, those goals aren't entirely compatible because uh, Ruby just isn't that way, but it's surprising how little actually has to be given up in order to have efficiency. Um, so, uh, oh, and I should say, properly speaking, Ocelot is not a compiler, but a Ruby, Ruby to C translator, which is not, uh, in my opinion, a true compiler. Um, but, hello. Uh, it should still be pretty fast, regardless. Um, so, before we talk about Ruby, let's talk a little bit about an efficient language. Um, here's some C code. Um, this is a Fibonacci calculator. Now C is efficient because the compiler knows what the types of things are. Um, so for instance, um, when it comes time for the compiler to omit the instruction for this minus operator here, it knows that the types of its operands are integers. And so it can omit the integer version of the minus instruction um, instead of some, some uh, polymorphic instruction sequence that uh, switches off depending on uh, the runtime type of, of the operands, uh, choosing a float or an integer or a char minus. And, you know, and likewise with this plus instruction, the compiler can see that the um, return value of the fib method is an int, uh, so the, uh, it emits the uh, integer version of the plus instruction. Um, and uh, even more than that, um, when it comes time to omit the, the call site for these, these fib calls here and here, uh, the compiler can see uh, uh, where the target of those calls is. And this is recursive, so the target is the same method. But um, uh, being able to see where the target of the calls are means that the compiler can do things like inlining or um, uh, tail recursion or tail recursion elimination, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and most of this would be true uh, even if uh, C were a polymorphic language. Even if, if you were allowed to have multiple versions of FIB, you could still uh, have all these nice optimizations. Um, so now here's a Ruby version of the same algorithm. Ruby is several orders of magnitude slower than C when running this code. Um, and um, the major difference between these two is, you know, aside from syntactical differences, is that Ruby has no type declaration for anything. Um, so it's very difficult for a compiler to get a grip on uh, what the types of things are going to be at runtime. Um, you know, in this code, we'd normally expect n to be an int, but according to the semantics of the language, n could be an array, it could be a string, uh, it could be anything. Uh, so, uh, and because of that, it makes it very difficult for the, the compiler to generate efficient call sites. And, and the calls are everywhere in Ruby. You know, there's, it's not just these fibs here, but all of these operators, minus, plus, less than or equal, those are all calls. Um, and those are all pretty slow. So, um, you know, writing a compiler for Ruby is something I've wanted to do for a very long time. Um, and it's something I, more or less gave up on a number of years ago. It just seemed too hard to solve that problem. You, know, you just can't get a grip on what, what types of things are in Ruby. Um, uh, but then there was a breakthrough. Um, now, in Ruby we have this tradition of writing tests. Ruby's the most test-heavy language 
that I've ever, I've ever encountered. Um, and um, so here's an example test for the FIB method. Now, you notice something very interesting about this test. The arguments to FIB in the test are all integers. Likewise, the returns of FIB are all integers. So what if you had the compiler run the unit test for the code that it's compiling and then extract type definite, uh, the types of uh, the expressions as they go flying past and use those pragmatically as a kind of type, type declaration, right? I call this type induction. Um, type induction is to be contrasted with a camel style type inference where the compiler uh, sees uh, what types what uh, methods are being used on a specific variable and infers a type declaration for that variable that's com that uh, has all of those methods in it. Um, uh, I, I should also mention, I didn't invent this idea. Um, uh, there's two other people who seem to have independently come up with the same, same idea and um, and, and told me about it. Those two people are Rich Morin and Josh Susser. Both of them are at the conference, but I don't see them in the room today. Uh, I did come up with this name, type induction, however. Okay, so now I've been using this, this word type, which is kind of a controversial religious word in Ruby. Um, it's been the cause of flame wars in the past. Now, even though it's such a dangerous term, um, I think uh, it's actually the appropriate one, and, but I should, I should spend a few moments to uh, uh, give a definition of what is a type in Ruby. Um, and I think I can come up with a definition that's both one that we can all agree on and one that's useful for writing compilers. Uh, so what is a type? Now here's some wrong answers. Um, some people, for instance, would say Ruby has no types. Now while there are no type declarations, it is not true that Ruby values have no types. Um, now you might say that classes are the types. And that's a closer, a closer approach to, to the definition at any rate. Um, and it's true enough in a static language, uh, but it's leaving out uh, an important aspect of the way Ruby works, which is singleton classes. Um, in Ruby, you can change the behavior of an object at runtime um, and so, it, and, and that changes its singleton type, singleton class. So maybe these singleton classes are the type. Well, it's closer yet, but it's still not quite right. Um, and it's, that's actually, I believe, a, co a correct definition of type. However, the problem is it's really not very useful. Um, singleton classes uh, uh, are uh, too numerous. Uh, every uh, object which has singleton classes um, has a, is a unique singleton class. So potentially a program that's using singleton classes can have very, very many types or an infinite number even. Um, and that's, that's too many to deal with statically. So here's a good definition of type. Type is class plus decorators. Um, so when an object is born, its type is its class, they're the same. Uh, but over its lifetime, it may get decorated with these uh, modifications to its behavior, like here. Um, and uh, the, 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 the class that it's born with, plus uh, the list of decorators that are applied to it over its lifetime, together define the type of a value. And here's another definition of type. This is probably even better than the last one, uh, because it results in fewer types overall. Um, type is the object set of name to method body mapping, which is to say it's a hash of method names to method implementations. Um, this is the most exact definition. I think it really captures the essence of what a type is. Um, um, and, and it is um, equivalent to this definition, um, although it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, that's to say that there may be multiple paths through the graph of decorators to a single unique set of method name to method body mappings. Um, now, type inductance is very powerful. I mean, it's the, the key insight 
uh, for this project, uh, but it does have some problems. So I want to uh, cover how, the, how we're going to address those problems. Um, one is the issue of coverage. So here's the Fibonacci code I showed before, right? Uh, but I could have written it like this. That is, I could have, I could have made a, a weaker test. Um, now, in, in this version, I'm only passing 0 and 1 to fib. And that will mean that this first line of fib is the only one that gets executed. The second one never, never is even hit. Um, so as a result, the type inducer, uh, when it's examining fib, uh, will never uh, get a chance to see what the types of the expressions in the second line are. It won't have any information about them. Uh, so uh, clearly, in order to be able to type induce your program, you first have to have pretty much complete code coverage. Um, but code coverage isn't the only type of coverage. Now let's imagine we have this situation. Uh, we have these three animal classes, and they each have a call method, which corresponds to the sound the animal makes. Um, and then there's this zoo class over here, which is a collection of animals. And the zoo also has a sound that it makes. When all the animals in the zoo make their call at once, we have a cacophony. Uh, and, that there's a, and, then, and then there's a test over here for the cacophony method. But there's a problem with this test, right? I forgot to put a bird into the zoo when I created it. So as a result, well, the type inducer will never see, in this line, never see that the variable animal could have the type of bird. Uh, uh, there isn't a code coverage issue here. All the expressions in cacophony are being covered. Uh, but there is a, a, a lack of what I call type coverage. Now another problem with, yes? What if uh, all, of those, all of those different classes inherited from, say, class animal or something? Because I think I would think that uh, a zoo or cacophony would be, uh, any sort of animal would be able to keep a call, and that would be what the call would make a cacophony. Would, it, would, uh, would this sort of compiler be able to understand that? Uh, that wouldn't really help by itself. Uh, you, you, the ancestor is just sort of a way of um, initializing um, the class uh, when it's when you first create it. Um, so another top another problem with type induction is uh, mocks. Um, uh, mocks are basically fake types. They're fake objects with fake types, and so uh, they, at runtime they're polluting the information that the type inducer is, is able to obtain. Uh, and and they, they cause the type inducer to, to, to believe that. Uh, some of your expressions will have types that aren't actually possible at runtime. Um, and even worse, they cause it to believe to, uh, it could be a sign that your tests um, uh, aren't exercising all of the types that all of your expressions could have. Um, and so again, you'd have a lack of, of proper type coverage. Um, so I, uh, don't use mocks. Um, in general, I personally dislike mocks, and for the same reason that the compiler dislikes mocks. Um, they divorce your tests from reality. Uh, use of a mock means you're, you're exercising your code in an artificial environment, which doesn't correspond to the actual runtime. Um, in a few circumstances, it may be justified in order to uh, interact with something external, like a server or a piece of hardware. Kind of have to have a mock then. Uh, but even if you do that, uh, you should also have another test which uh, exercises that code using the actual real types that could actually. Question? Yeah. Um, what about like the fact that if you use no mocks, um, any failure in your code like can cover the whole code base because it's going all the way through. Where you know many times you want to isolate your code for certain types of tests, say unit tests, to only that. Well, uh, you know, mocks can be nice to kind of uh, uh, narrow down uh, the range of code that's being executed. I, I can see the advantage of that. Um, what I'm trying to say is if you do use a mock, uh, 
make sure that you also have some kind of integration type test, which is not using the mock, which is actually testing the whole stack uh, with the real types that are going to be present at runtime. Uh, I don't want to forbid people from using mocks. It's a, you know, a very popular thing to do. Um, it, it's not going to be a disaster, but you do need to make sure you get complete type coverage. Um, and, and I'll be talking about some of the other uh, ways of dealing with, with uh, uh, missing type coverage. Uh, okay. So I've talked about type in induction, some of its problems. Um, but first, let's, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about this a little more, but first let's explore some of the C code that, that the compiler is actually going to generate. Um, keep in mind, these examples that I'm giving are pseudocode. Uh, reality, as usual, is more complicated than this. Um, but it'll give you the idea of what's going to go on. So what happens, for instance, when the compiler sees a call site? Uh, here's a call site that I snipped out of that example I gave earlier. Um, what should that look like in C? This is one possibility. Uh, this is what C++ does. Um, C++ ha uh, 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 adds a hidden field to every object, uh, which they call the vtable. Um, here I'm calling it the class. Um, that's the name that's used by MRI internally. Now it's a kind of deceptive name because we know class and type aren't the same thing necessarily, um, but that's the standard terminology for Ruby. Um, uh, so, and then hanging off of this V table or class, there'll be a table of um, pointers to actual method implementations. And so, at runtime, um, uh, the compiler dereferences the object reference to find the class, and then dereferences uh, a pointer in the in the table in the class uh, in the class table to find the actual method implementation, and then jumps to that. Um, and this is an okay way to do it. C++ does this a lot. It's not very slow. Um, but there's another way. Instead of jumping to a pointer, you could switch off of the class field. And when it has a type known to the compiler, actually jump straight to the implementation of the method for that, for that, uh, for that type. Um, now, probably some of you are looking at this a little bit sideways and saying, Okay, you're going to take my nice little Ruby calls and you're going to turn them into this big, ugly switch statement like this. Why do you want to do that? There are some pretty good reasons for doing it this way. Uh, one is that avoiding the indirect call means you avoid the pipeline stall that those calls usually cause. Um, a, a, a direct call, even, even if you have several branches preceding it, is going to be predicted by the uh, processor better, and, and as a result, it's going to be a little faster. Um, another advantage to this technique is that it enables inlining. Uh, and when, you, when you know exactly which method you're going to call, it's relatively straightforward for the compiler to just inline the implementations of those methods directly in the appropriate switch branch. Uh, whereas with this version, it's hard to see how the compiler is going to inline it at all without converting it to this first. Uh, and uh, again, this isn't my idea. I stole this out of a paper on Small Eiffel, uh, which is the open source Eiffel compiler. Uh, well, let's see. Yes, so com both compilers and processors benefit from having explicit knowledge of what the targets of your call sites are going to be. Um, now, there's something kind of interesting going on in the default case down here. The default case corresponds to the case where the compiler didn't know what the type at runtime is. But when at a type at runtime is encountered that the compiler didn't expect. Um, so that indicates uh, a gap in type coverage. Um, so now, one thing you could do at this point is you could just raise an exception. You know, something happened I didn't expect. Sorry. But there would be a problem with that, uh, because then your compiler would be introducing bugs into your program that weren't present in the interpreted version. It's much, much better 
not to do that if it's at all possible. Uh, so what, I, what I've got here is an RB fun call. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, writing C extensions or with Ruby internals, that's the way that Ruby itself handles method calls internally, uh, this RB fun call function. Um, and it's every bit as slow as a normal uh, method call in Ruby. In fact, it's probably a little bit slower. Uh, but it works, and it preserves the full semantics of the original code. Now, the other thing going on in the switch statement is I've got this warning. Um, re remember, going, on, going into the default case means that you have a, a lack of type coverage. And as good testers, that's something you ought to want to know about. Um, and you ought to like, be looking at these warnings and, and using them as clues as to how to write better tests which means that the next time the compiler runs, it will have more information and will better be able to compile your program. Now, one problem with these warnings, uh, or another thing you can do with these is the compiler can actually use these directly as input. So uh, on a subsequent recompile of the same code, it can actually um, see where, where there was a, a, a type that wasn't expected the first time and, and generate the correct code the second time, and you get Again, uh, a better compile. Um, that's a somewhat weaker technique than actually fixing your tests because that information quickly becomes stale, uh, whereas your tests presumably don't. Um, but either way, uh, it's a good idea. Now let me try to talk as briefly as possible about object representation. Uh, Here's an example Ruby class, and obviously uh, it has three instance variables, foobar and baz. How is this going to be represented in C? This is what the interpreter does. Uh, every uh, object, every Ruby object is represented by one of these R object things. Um, an R object has three fields in it. It has a flag field. Um, it has the class that we talked about before. And it has this uh, IVAR table, which is a, a hash where the instance variables are kept. And this works, uh, but there's a little bit better way. Since we can tell uh, fairly clearly what the instance variables in the class are, why not just inline them directly into the appropriate structure? Um, that way, uh, access to those instance variables will be done uh, basically as an, an array dereference instead of as a, a hash lookup. That's both faster and it uses less memory. Uh, and I, I think Ruby 1.9 already does something like this. I, I'm not sure of the details. Uh, it may be limited in some way. Um, and then when it comes to bindings, we have much the same issue. Uh, it's relatively easy to analyze a method for the set of local variables in use in it. Um, and uh, you can use that to create a, a custom SAC frame for each method, which contains the uh, uh, local variables in use in that method, uh, as well as uh, a hash table. Um, in both of these cases, you keep the hash table, um, and that's uh, used as sort of a backup for the case where the variable is used dynamically but not statically, and you could, which you couldn't otherwise detect. So, other than polymorphic dynamic method calls, let's talk about some of the other issues that a, a compiler is going to run into, because there are a number of them. Um, so, Ruby has these singleton methods, singleton classes. Uh, it has modules you can extend your objects by. Um, and all of these present more or less the same problem, um, which is that you're changing the type of uh, uh, a value at runtime. How is that going to be done in C? C uh, doesn't allow you to change types of things, really. You know, C, C objects, uh, or C types don't even really exist at runtime in the same way they do in Ruby. Um, but remember, uh, the Ruby, the type of a Ruby object is stored in this class field here. Um, 
And there's no reason you couldn't just change that as necessary in order to uh, uh, make it the, the value that it needs to be. Um, the object's type is really just an aspect of its state. Um, and the, the boundary between the type and state is, if you really think about it, it's, it's not that firm of a thing. Um, and there's no reason why the type can't be mutable, just like the state is, even though you know, most static languages don't really support that. OK, so what about method missing? Here's another difficult feature uh, in, a, in a dynamic language. It's hard to support statically. Um, the, the problem with this is it, it makes the flow of control pretty hard to follow. Uh, a compiler can never know when an a innocent looking method call is actually going to end up calling method missing instead. Um, uh, and, and in a program that's using method, uh, let's see, no. Uh, I, I should add that if it were not for this one feature, we probably would have had a compiler a number of years ago based on a camel style type inference. Method missing inhibits that. But it's a useful feature, and it's used in all kinds of neat things. Um, so we want to be able to support it. Now let's go back and look at this example method call I showed before. Uh, now what if we, we allow the, uh, the type to be, the type of the receiver to be a delegate instead at this point, which responds to mo most methods with, the method, with its method missing uh, call. Um, Once the compiler figures out that a call to method missing is possible for a specific type at a, at a particular call site, it can just generate you know, the, the call to method missing at that point. Um, you do have to pass an extra parameter for the method name. Um, but it really, type induction handles this problem quite beautifully. Um, you also have to make sure that you, you've got complete uh, coverage of your types over the call sites where method missing can be called. Um, but it, it, it's really um, in contrast to type inference, which just falls apart completely in this case. Uh, you, you can uh, handle this really with no problems. And then there's eval. Some people call this evil. And there's a good reason for that. This really makes writing a compiler hell. You just can't tell. What's going to happen when there's an eval? There could be arbitrary side effects inside the eval. You know, it, you can't tell what the argument to eval is going to be uh, in the general case. Um, eval is sort of the essence of what an interpreter does. It takes a string at runtime and interprets it. How are you going to compile that? But it turns out that most calls to eval are actually static, which is to say that the argument, there's only ever one argument that's really possible, or maybe a, a fairly narrow range of arguments. Um, so if you can figure out what that one argument is, um, you, can, you can deal with that. Discovering that statically is kind of difficult. In fact, it's impossible in a lot of cases. Um, but we can use the same trick as we did with type induction. That is, we can run the unit test, see what argument was passed to eval in the unit test, and uh, just assume that at runtime, that it's going to be the same argument. Um, so in other words, calls to eval will turn into something like this. You check to see if the argument was the expected one. And if it was, you just inline that code directly at that point. Uh, Notice there's, there's, no, there's no eval call left in this code now. There's also no quote around this code that, that had been quoted before, or in a string at any rate. Um, uh, now the other thing going on here also, we've got this else clause, right? And the correct thing for me to do at this point, if the argument wasn't an expected one, would be just to fall back to the interpreter's version of eval and use, uh, uh, and use that. Um, I actually think that failing at this point is going to be a better thing to do. Um, if there's a, uh, if the, the call to eval has an unexpected argument, 
that indicates one of two things. Either you didn't have proper eval coverage in your test, which is something you want to know about, or possibly user input is able to influence the call to an eval. That latter is considered a bad thing usually, although it's useful in some programs. Uh, every eval call is a potential code injection attack. So having a tool which can eliminate those attacks entirely is, is probably a good idea. Um, and expecting your tests to have complete eval coverage is not that extreme of a requirement. Um, it's, it, that, that's something your tests really should do. Okay, so this magic way of predicting what the calls to eval are gonna be, that's something I call eval prescience. So overall, the process of using the compiler works something like this. Use type induction and eval prescience to narrow down the actual range of dynamic behavior in your program. The compiler then uses the information gathered in those stages to produce a static version of your program. Um, but the information it gathers is only really as good as your tests. Um, and most tests, even tests for Ruby projects, really aren't complete enough. So the runtime also emits log statements telling you whether there are gaps in your test coverage, um, and you should use those log statements to make your tests more complete, which makes more information available to the compiler on the next cycle. Probably three or four times through, through a cycle like this, and you'll have pretty complete tests which uh, describe the behavior of the program pretty well. Uh, so we can deal with um, the lack of, of type coverage and of coverage in general in four different ways. Uh, one, there's the fallback to the interpreter when something unexpected happens. Uh, two, we have this virtuous circle which is hopefully causing, uh, causing you to continuously improve the uh, test coverage and thus the uh, information available to the compiler. Um, three, we have the warnings emitted by the runtime which can use, be used directly by the compiler as input uh, and type hints uh, to optimize sub subsequent recompiles. And then there's a fourth secret technique which I believe to be the most powerful, but I'm not gonna tell you about that yet. Okay, now let's talk about the really hard stuff. I said that, for instance, most calls to eval are static. Well, there are dynamic, call, dynamic calls to eval. For instance, in this program. Does anyone recognize this program? Who said REPL? Right. This is what Lisp calls a, a REPL. It stands for read eval print loop. Um, basically, this is, this is a very simple version of IRB taking input from the user and evaluating it. Uh, so uh, no matter how much you test this code, you're never gonna cover all the possible inputs to eval. Um, it's pretty, pretty well hopeless. Uh, so this is a case that's basically incompilable, uh, but uh, it, it's, 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 it's impossible to compile it completely. Um, however, it, it is possible to compile it to something that ends up calling eval in this, in this inner loop here. Um, and, you know, for that matter, who really needs IRB to be faster than it is right now? Now, there are, there are other interesting cases for this kind of thing. Uh, for instance, if you were writing a, a spreadsheet in Ruby, and the natural thing to do would be to use Ruby as the uh, cell formula language. In that case, again, you've got user input being passed to the eval. Um, so things will be happening at runtime that weren't predictable. Um, so probably uh, I think that there'll be a, um, some kind of hint that you can give the compiler to tell it that uh, those few places where there is a really genuinely dynamic call to eval, this, hey, hey, this one's a dynamic eval, and so it'll know how to ha handle that a little bit differently. Compiling in those cases. Um, I don't know a lot about just-in-time compiling. It's not, that's not the approach that, that, that I prefer. Um, it, it could be done. Um, it, if, if what you're doing, if the output of the compiler is C, then a, a just-in-time compiler means that you're gonna be 
running the C compiler in the background, and it's not really optimized for uh, compile speed that way in the way like, uh, yeah, it, it's not optimized the way, the way that a Java JIT compiler is. Um, so it may not be a real good idea. Um, no. Yes. Yeah. Right, now, now one thing that that uh, uh, you might want to do, uh, for instance, is have a sort of background compiler that runs in a separate process that it gathers the warnings emitted by uh, default cases, and uh, uh, and then uses that to, you know, maybe like every ten minutes, recompile your program, as long as there continues to be warnings. Um, Something like that for a very long running process, like most Rails apps, uh, would probably be a pretty good thing. That means that the Rails app would start off kind of slow and then it would get faster and then it would get faster. Um, uh, that's not really a JIT. But you know, overall, this, this technique is more or less the same thing as what goes on in a JIT compiler. It's just a little slower. Um, it's, it's slower in that, that uh, the, the, the cycle, uh, the feedback cycle is slower. Um, it, so you, you know, it, you, you first run the tests in one process, and you gather information about your program there, and then you use the information and to do the compile, um, and that's a whole. Uh, uh, it, it, you, and you quickly get to a basically static version of your program, which has uh, uh, pretty static behavior, unlike in, in Java where. You're co constantly running inside of the virtual machine, and you, um, you know, basically don't have any control over when the compiler is running, and when there, you know, might be extra work to be done. Uh, although Java does a pretty good job of hiding that. Um, okay, so there's another another important case to consider. There's a dynamic typing version of the dynamic val problem. Uh, see, in this program, I've got, let's say, 20 modules. And they're being mixed in to an object in random order. Um, that adds up to 20 factorial different possible types. That's probably more than the number of atoms in the universe. So there's no way you're ever going to be able to exercise this program enough uh, to enumerate all of the types, nor will there ever be enough memory to store all of those types. Um, so this this program, again, is incompilable. On the other hand, this is really rare. I've, I've never seen or heard of code that actually does this. Um, did, does, has anybody ever written any code that does something? Paul raises his hand. Plug, plug in something like that, because you can plug in in any order. OK. But in any given program, you're usually loading in, this, in the same order, right? You specified it in a configuration file or something like that. Okay. Yes, that's true. I don't know if it actually helps any, but do you actually really need to know the order or just the last one that defines the call? Ah, good question. That depends on whether the, the method actually has a call to super in it or not. Um, if there's no call to super, then you're not chaining the methods up, and and uh, the order is much less important, and the actual number of types is uh, approachable again. Um, to to go back to Paul's point, I th I think that's somehow uh, well to to handle that kind of case, you would need to um, uh, you 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 need to have the config file basically be part of your compile be part of the input to the compiler. Um, and that, that could get a little tricky. Um, all right, so that's the end. I want to thank you all for coming and listening to me. Uh, and here's some information about me, my email address and my blog. And I hesitate to put the blog up there because there's, I haven't updated it in a long time. There's not much on there anyway. Uh, there's also this mailing list, which I've started to, to uh, uh, for discussing this and, and similar topics. Um, uh, and um, I want to add that it, 
I'm actively looking for uh, collaborators and people who want to help me with this, or maybe there's somebody out there who'd like to sponsor me for doing this work. Um, and in the about five minutes remaining, open the floor up to questions. How does, uh, how does code which is dependent on other libraries work? Do the libraries, would you use some type of library loading, like the libraries would have to be compiled as well, or would, because I'm trying to think, if the libraries weren't compiled, would you need a <coughs> test for the libraries to be run to infer all the types, or to determine all the types for the libraries as well? And, yeah, basically the libraries have to be compiled as well, and the libraries have to have tests, which is, again, are part of the compile process. Um, would you do those separately? You compile the library and have a compiled version that then your, your client program would, would load the compiled version of the library, or would you compile it all as one big unit? You probably could do it separately, but it's better to have, um, for a dynamic language, to have all of the source code available to the compiler um, so that it can, you know, it can get a complete picture of what's going on. That's called whole program compilation. Wouldn't, uh, if you did compile your libraries beforehand using this compiler, it could be used for the commit you built compiler? Couldn't you ship uh, some sort of summary of the types in addition to the actual compiled code with them? Yes, you could, um, but the compiler really wants to be able to see other things that are going on inside of the um, external source code as well. Um, you know, to be able to do some, if you want, if you want to be able to like inline, for instance, calls to things in your compiler, you you have to have that source code available. Any so what's the state of the compiler, and how are you testing its performance? Uh, at this point, uh, I have. Uh, type induction almost finished. Um, uh, so it's really not very far along. Um, but so the next thing to do uh, is to start actually generating C code from parse trees. Um, that's, I think, going to be fairly easy. Um, and as far as testing performance, well, you know, you run some code through it and see how fast it is, compare that to other implementations. Uh, there, there is a, a, a project called Ruby Benchmark Suite out there for uh, benchmarking Ruby implementations and operations that they do. Um, or you could benchmark Ruby spec, or you could benchmark Rails. Um, you know, there's lots of possible things. Uh, yes? So you're linking in the Ruby interpreter as well, such that potentially if there's code you depend on that wasn't, that they can't be compiled or whatever. Um, you can still deal with that. Yes. Right? Yes. It's just slow. Yes. <laughs> I'm linking in the Ruby interpreter. Uh, the, the C code for the Ruby interpreter in the theory executable also. Um, if you can guarantee that there aren't going to be any calls to eval and that you have good type coverage, um, you could potentially leave the interpreter out. Um, probably that's not a real good idea, but it might be an attractive option for some people. Is there another question over here? Yeah. Why, why restrict your type induction to only come from tests? Why not come from other parts of the program? Especially if you have a whole program that you can do uh, some sort of data flow analysis from. Uh, well, that's a good question. And, and you don't need to. Um, in, in fact, uh, you know, what you really need is just to exercise the code in some way. And you want to do that exercise in some way that in the end of the day, um, there's going to be no uh, persisting side effects. So tests fulfill all those conditions, um, but depending on your, your application, there may be a variety of other things you can do that also uh, can be used. How do you go about uh, handling when dynamic code calls the inverse of the compiled code? Um, you know, say it sets, <coughs> sets an instance variable uh, that does or doesn't exist in, in your class. Um, well, so as far as just calling code from, from the dynamic side to the static call side, that would go through an RB fun call, um, which would be slow. Um, um, uh, the instance variables, basically each uh, class will have to have a, a, a different implementation of instance variable get and set, which knows how to get to those uh, records in the um, 
uh, uh, statically allocated records in the class of structure. Yeah. So when you start, you mentioned that you're putting, instead of having the 90 tables, you have directly variables in there, right? Yes. But what happens when you start doing dynamically instance variable set in that table that's already being set up? Well, there's, there's going to be a, a custom version of instance variable set for each method, uh, for each, each class. So uh, uh, when you call instance variable set, it will call a specific version rather than the generic version uh, that the uh, interpreter has. I see people coming in, so I think that's the end of my time. Thank you all very much.